Okay, so Tim Bizard is a software developer at Julia Hub, and his, he is mainly working actually at several GPU packages. And if you have checked them out, he is really the main maintainer of them. And yeah, next to building these packages, he is also working on compiler functionality, so part of the Julia, Julia core itself, which is needed to support these GPU um, packages. And yeah, so Tim, thank you for being our guest today. Stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Am I audible? Loud yes. and clear? Great. Yeah. So hi, I'm Tim. Um, as Stefan mentioned, I work at Julia Hub uh, from Belgium. And I'm working on everything GPU related in the G Julia language. Specifically, I'm the maintainer of CUDA.gl, OneAPI.gl, and recently also Metal.gl. And I try to help out with all of the necessary functionality that is required to make GPU programming in Julia successful. There's a bunch of material online already, plenty of talks from previous Julia cons on specific subjects. But for this talk, I'm going to zoom out a little and go back to the beginning. What is GPU programming? Why you should be interested or why you might be interested in wanting to use a GPU? And how you can do so, of course, using Julia as your main uh, programming platform. Let's start out with what is a GPU. A GPU is essentially a massively parallel accelerator that consists of multiple processors, multiple, you can call them CPUs. Uh, in GPU land, we call them uh, streaming multiprocessors. And each of these have a much more simple control logic and cache than a normal CPU. But on the flip side, they have a much larger register file and lots of ALUs. And the result of that is that whereas on a CPU, you traditionally use fewer but very powerful threads that can do general purpose computing. On a GPU, you can launch many, many more threads, but they are much more lightweight. So in terms of the operations, in terms of the, the caches that are behind them, they are much more lightweight than all of the functionality you might expect to exist on a CPU. And in order to accommodate all of those threads, there's typically a high bandwidth memory bus to feed all those threads, but high bandwidth doesn't necessarily mean high, uh, low latency. So typically the latency with these memory buses are fairly high. So that's just the very, very brief introduction to what a GPU is. And these properties actually match fairly well on top of the demands of scientific computing because many scientific problems have lots of data. So there's lots of implicit parallelism to have all these threads do something. Um, but at the same time, uh, scientific computing also typically performs complex computations, which can be used to hide the memory latency of the memory bus that we have in a GPU system. And as a result, most of the GPU vendors here, I mentioned the, 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 the top ones, they do have a general purpose computing platform to make it possible to use GPUs for computing and maybe more specifically scientific computing. So for NVIDIA, we have the CUDA toolkit, uh, which you probably all know. AMD has Rockham, Intel has one API and Apple Apple's Metal toolkit, which is also meant for graphics programming can also be used for uh, compute programming. The problem is that all of these programming toolkits generally use a fairly low level language to program the GPU. It's typically something C or C++ based. And of course, we want to swap this out with Julia uh, being one of our favorite programming languages. And this is basically what we have been working for uh, the past couple of years, taking these toolkits and trying to replace the programming languages used with them with Julia. So in the case of NVIDIA, we have CUDA.gl, AMD has AMD GPU.gl. You can program Intel GPUs with one API.gl. And lastly, Apple GPUs, or at least the M series GPUs can be programmed with metal.gl. So lots of different packages. However, the key features and the design of all of these backends is, is somewhat similar. We aim to be as user-friendly as possible. So to make it possible to get started with GPU programming as quickly as possible, but at the same time, without sacrificing the performance that some users might need to get to all of the performance that a GPU has to offer. 
in order to do so, we offer multiple programming interfaces at different levels of abstraction. And one key feature that we've recently been improving is the ability to write very portable GPU applications that work across GPU vendors. So for this talk, I'm going to zoom in onto each of these bits. So initially, user friendliness, trying to make it as easy as possible to use a GPU. One of the, the core features there is the installability, which is typically a pain point, especially if you've tried or heard about people uh, installing CUDA on their system to run, run some machine learning code. And we try to facilitate that as much as possible by redistributing binary artifacts, so parts of the vendor toolkits, by using Julia artifacts. So as a result, you, you need fewer, uh, there's fewer requirements on your system that you would have in other languages. For example, with CUDA.gl, we only require you to have the NVIDIA driver installed. We will automatically inspect at runtime which driver you have installed and download and install locally the necessary toolkit and libraries that are required to get a functional CUDA environment. Same with one API, where you only need a sufficiently recent uh, Linux kernel. Metal, of course, requires uh, Mac OS, but nothing more. Uh, AMD GPU.jl at this point still requires Rockham to be installed, but the situation is also improving. And the second thing we do to make the GPU backends as user-friendly as possible is to do a bunch of simplifications to get you started more quickly. For example, here on the right hand side, you can see that in metal, in order to execute code, you have to look up the device, you have to create a command queue, and you have to do a bunch of other low level stuff. Whereas with metal.gl, you can just start and, and write a metal kernel and execute it immediately. We will, we will default to a, a sane device. We will automatically instantiate a command queue and maintain that in the current Julia task and so on. But as I mentioned before, it's not because we make things user-friendly that the flexibility is gone. It's, it's always still possible to use all of the very low-level wrappers. And for example, here, again, look up the default device and create our own command queue. So that's the overview of the user-friendliness. Um, in order to program GPUs, we also offer multiple interfaces that either offer more user-friendliness or more flexibility. Uh, broadly speaking, you can, you can divide them in three levels. So at, at the highest level, we have application level GPU functionality. Whereas, for example, where, for example, with Flux, you can just use this magical GPU function that the Flux.gl package has to offer. Now, this kind of programmability is not particularly relevant to this talk because it differs from application to application and it's not strictly speaking, general purpose GPU programming, it's application specific toggles that make it use the GPU. So I'm going to ignore this, this abstraction level for a bit. The most popular and easiest to use abstraction level to work with the GPU is the array programming level, where you use arrays to express the data parallelism that your problem or application has to offer and how to perform applications on that in a data parallel fashion. And broadly speaking, across all of these backends, it's going to look fairly similar. So you start by importing a GPU package, uh, you allocate or initialize some data, and you upload it to the device by calling the GPU array constructor. And then because of how Julia's multiple dispatch work, operations that you perform on these GPU arrays will automatically execute on the GPU. So that's a nice feature that just follows out of the design of the Julia language. And the goal essentially is for these GPU arrays to be as compatible with the base CPU array type as possible. And that's interesting because it allows you to develop code on the CPU to make sure everything works and then between quotes, ported to the GPU by changing the array type. So lots of familiar functionality has been specialized for these GPU arrays. So you can take views, you can call functions like sum, uh, do a multiplication, take an adjoint, and so on and so forth. All these will either just work out of the box or dispatch to specialized functionality on the GPU. 
we also integrate with packages and standard libraries. Um, for example, here I'm demonstrating that we, we not only have our own native functionality, but we also use NVIDIA's, in this case, CUDA.jl's vendor libraries. For example, functionality from the random.jl standard library is generally implemented using the current library from NVIDIA. Uh, many functionality from the linear algebra standard library is implemented with Kublas. Um, sparse arrays is implemented with QSparse, and so on and so forth. This depends a little between the different backends. So the CUDA.jl backend is the most mature at this point, just because we've been working the longest on that package. Uh, if you're using metal.jl, which is the youngest package, then probably many of these will not necessarily have been optimized or implemented with GPU-specific functionality. But the real power of using the array abstraction in Julia are these higher order abstractions. Now that sounds like a complicated term, but it basically means that it's an abstraction, a function that takes another function as an argument. And the prime example is the map function. For example, here I'm showing this do block syntax, which basically constructs an anonymous function that performs x plus one, uh, which is the transformation you wanna perform on an element of your array. And by calling the map function, you will pass this anonymous function as an argument to map. What's powerful about this is that this composes our implementation, which is a, a library implementation of the map function with user provided code performing the X plus one. And this is only possible because we have a JIT compiler. We can generate kernel code at runtime that composes the library definition with the user code and generate a single kernel definition. And this, the same applies to a couple of others, like the, the dot notation is basically broadcast, which is essentially the same. An anonymous function is composed with the broadcast implementation and a kernel is generated. Uh, the reduce function or the map reduce function is similar. Uh, we have others like accumulate, find first, sort functionality, and so on. And, and this, is, this is something that's not easily possible in other languages because, again, we have a JIT compiler that compiles Julia code down to kernels for the GPU. Um, and this, this is, is in fact so, po so powerful that it's often sufficient for people as, as a means of expressing their applications, um, making it so that you don't necessarily have to be able to write kernels or know how to program the GPU. If you know which array abstractions we have at our disposal and have been optimized for the GPU, you can compose those with your codes to create custom kernels for your applications without having to know how to write a GPU kernel. Because as I'll come to this last, later in my talk, writing kernels is, is not as easy always. If, if you can use the array programming interface, it's much easier and often uh, performs pretty well um, to run code on the GPU. And to illustrate that this is a fairly powerful way of doing things, here's some simple code that I took Oh, there is a question in the in the chat. Can I, any, everyone see anything other than black screen for the speaker? Is is there anything wrong with my slides not being shown? So I can see your slide, just, yeah, completely and switching. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think I can just recommend using another browser. Sometimes I, I hear people have difficulties joining the session from specific browser. It might be that this helps. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I'm not yeah. presenting in the void here. <laughs> um, yeah. So to continue, let me ask this you is... one question, maybe, um, because sure. uh, you, this, yeah, this JIT computation was was really kind of super interesting. Um, so you, the GPU package itself is um, transforming the Julia code to GPU kernels automatically or yes and no we are doing this by reusing the julia compiler so this is also one of the neat things the more compiler technically things of this approach is that instead of writing our own compiler that takes julia source code or the julia ast and compiles that down to um, code for the gpu we actually reuse the llvm code generator that's part of the julia compiler 
and then tweak or slightly change the produced LLVM IR to be GPU compatible. And in order to make this possible, we, we've added a couple of interfaces to the code generator that allows us to tweak and tune the Julia code generator to produce GPU compatible code. And the big advantage of this is that if uh, a new Julia version comes out, we don't necessarily have to update to the new features of the language because we are reusing most of the compiler and as a result will quickly be supporting the latest version of Julia and the latest language features that the language has to offer. That sounds impressive, yeah, thank you. So for a bit back to array programming, this is an example that I literally took from this course a couple of years back implementing a, a very simple linear regression model in Julia with very nice, readable, high-level array expressions like we're used to writing readable code in Julia, at least initially, not when we're necessarily optimizing things to get to all of the performance. So you might have written this code, and then the question is, how do we execute this on the GPU? Well, the nice, the nice example here is that we just need to switch our inputs from CPU array types to GPU compatible Q array types, which will then result in all of these operations like the, the, the matrix multiplication, the broadcast, and so on and so forth, to be automatically executing on the GPU. And as you can see in the in the performance chart, it is it even performs reasonably well insofar that we are outperforming the CPU at some point. Um, of course, this, this isn't highly tuned, highly optimized code, but at least it shows how you can fairly naively take a array-based application and simply port that to the GPU or explore at least using the GPU by using the array abstraction. Of course, at some point, you might have to write your own kernels because, for example, some of these operations you're doing turns out to be slow or turns out to be GPU incompatible, where GPU incompatibility generally means that it falls back to an abstract array implementation that uses for loops. Because if you have a for loop that implements an operation, you'll essentially be fetching element by element from the GPU, perform the operation and copy it back. If you have a for loop in your code, you won't be using the GPU generally. Unless, of course, you're performing array operations in a for loop, that's a different thing. But many of the abstract array fallbacks perform scalar indexing, and this is something we warn about. And that might be a reason that you have to write your own kernel, because, again, some of these array uh, operations you're invoking is not implemented for the GPU. The beauty is that in Julia, with all of these backends I've mentioned, you, we can do so. We can actually write kernel code in Julia that's, as Stefan mentioned, is then compiled down to uh, GPU compatible code. And this slide shows how, on the right hand side, you would perform a vector addition, a very simple operation in CUDA. So you start out by allocating some data, copying that data to the GPU. Then you write a kernel function. A kernel function is a, a scalar function that performs a, typically updates a single element in an array. And then you launch that function in a parallel configuration. For example, here I'm launching semantically 512 copies of this vector addition function. And the computation within that function is going to be differentiated by the function looking up its own thread index. And that value can then be used to, in this case, select which element we have to update. So that's the CUDA C part. On the left-hand side, you can see how we would implement this in Julia using CUDA.gl. And the host code, as you can see, is very much simplified. So instead of having to do these manual malloc and mem copy calls, we can just call a CUDA constructor. So that's one of the things I mentioned. We try to simplify the initial programming experience as much as possible. However, the kernel code below the vector addition function is actually fairly similar to the CUDA C code. And this is, this is intentionally. Uh, because kernel programming is generally a fairly advanced programming abstraction, we stick to the programming abstraction that is defined by the vendor because it allows us to write high performance code that 
performs essentially identically to what you would have written in C, which is generally what people who write kernel code want. They don't want a high level abstraction that they have to sacrifice some performance for. So if you know how to write a kernel, you probably want to be able to do so in a way that you can get to all of the performance. And that's why, whereas we generally simplify the host code a lot, the device code is generally similar to what you would have written in a low level language. Sometimes, of course, we, we take some, some, we perform some changes uh, in order to provide a more consistent interface. For example, with uh, metal.gl, the thread index I mentioned before has to be passed as an argument to the kernel function, whereas in all of the other backends, we do so using an intrinsic function. Um, as a result, we change it so that with metal.gl, you actually also use an intrinsic function to query the thread position. So it's a very minor change. In the case of oneapi.gl, we do some more changes, again, for the sake of consistency across these backends, so that's easier for somebody who knows how to write kernel code in kudit.gl to do the same in other backends as well. So apart from a consistent interface, um, all of our backends also generally offer a consistent set of features that you require to develop your own GPU kernels. That's indexing intrinsics, uh, in order to query which threads you're, you're at, in order to differentiate your uh, computations. We generally also expose some form of shared memory. Shared memory is memory that is shared within the streaming multiprocessor and can be accessed faster rather than the global memory. And this is often used in order to avoid global communication and speed up your kernels. Uh, we generally also provide some subgroup operations. Those are specific operations within threads that execute uh, concurrently. It's a somewhat more advanced feature. I'm not going to go deeper into this. I just want to mention that they are available uh, as long as with atomic memory, which is uh, something that's also very interesting when multiple threads have to write to the same global memory. And those four features are um, generally chosen such that they make it possible to implement a huge variety of kernels. Uh, even though not all backends may be as full featured with these four features, it should be, it should be possible to implement high performance kernels for a variety of problems. If you, use, if you need more functionality, um, CUDA.gl is generally the most mature backend. It supports much more of the vendor language extensions that in this case, CUDA C has to offer, including, for example, dynamic parallelism, which is the ability to launch kernels from within kernels, uh, cooperative groups, which is a different abstraction than the uh, indexing based uh, example that I showed before, tensor course, which is a, a means to accelerate matrix multiplications within kernels, and so on and so forth. So, again, here, all of the backends have uh, support quite some abstractions that should allow everything you need, but if you if you need more, CUDA.gl is generally the most mature backend with the most features that you might require for your application. And in order to demonstrate some of that, um, specifically how the JIT works, what you can do is if, you, if you've written a kernel function, for example, here, our vector addition kernel function, you can prefix any GPU application or any kernel launch with the add device code uh, family of macros, which are very similar to the uh, add code macros you might be familiar with from the interactive utilities package in base Julia. So here with add device code PTX, we can have a look at the PTX code, which is the CUDA specific virtual ISA code that's being generated. And here you can see the instructions that we generate for this vector addition function. Uh, and if you're familiar with it, you, you, you'd see that this is high quality, decent uh, GPU code being generated, which is something that Julia is known for on the CPU side, the ability to generate high quality code that performs well. The same applies to the GPU side, really. Um, we have the same for Apple. Uh, we have device code AGX, which shows the uh, assembly for the uh, AGX processors. Um, this is, in fact, using a reverse engineered compiler developed by the SI Linux folks, because all of this is, is closed source. So we have to, we have to be uh, 
you have to quite often reverse engineer things to make Metal GL work on latest Apple hardware. Uh, with the Intel stack, we use Spur V. So one API.gl actually contains or uses a Spur V compiler that can lower Julia code to Spur V, which might be interesting at some point in the future if we ever want to target Vulkan or OpenCL again. And so on and so forth. So uh, these are some details that you can use this to, to have a look at the code that's being generated for your kernels, which may be a good approach to optimizing your kernels. Uh, because sometimes you might want to make sure that your generated code do, does not contain any extraneous uh, code, for example, for exceptions being handled that can never occur at one time. Bounce checking is another a uh, feature that sometimes generates lots of code and you can spot this by looking at the generated code. However, that's quite a bit micro-optimization. Initially, what you should do is you should benchmark your GPU applications to make sure they perform well. And initially, you might be tempted to do so using the at time macro from base. For example, here I have a, a core array with 10 million items. Then I'm doing a broadcast edition with the reverse of my array. And this is actually a bad way of benchmarking because the execution time here is suspiciously low. And that's because it's important to note that GPUs execute asynchronously. If the CPU enqueues a kernel launch, for example, here, the broadcast and the reversal, there's no reason for the CPU to wait until the GPU has finished computing unless you actually need the results. And in this case, we weren't copying the results back to a CPU array, so there was no reason for the CPU to wait. And that's why this add time invocation was only actually measuring the time to enqueue these operations and not the time for them to finish. If you want to benchmark the time it takes for the GPU to complete something, you always have to wrap it with a CUDA.addSync invocation, which will make sure that the GPU is synchronized, which is a GPU lingo for waiting until the GPU is done. Instead of using base.addTime with CUDA.addSync, you can actually just use CUDA.addTime, which will do that, but additionally also report the number of GPU allocations, which may be useful. And of course, it's always possible and even recommended to use benchmark tools, but in that case, you have to make sure that you wrap your GPU, GPU code in CUDA.addSync because benchmark tools is generally uh, GPU unaware. And the same issue applies to profiling. So we cannot use base profiling tools like at profile. We have to use vendor specific tools that knows how a GPU executes. Now with CUDA.gl, again, being the most mature implementation of a GPU backend in Julia, we actually nowadays have an integrated profiler. So you can do CUDA.add profile of our kernel invocation and you can see two um, tables. One is the host site activity involving the APIs, the CUDA APIs that were being called by the CPU. And then executing in parallel the device side activity, which involves the two kernels that are executing here. With the other backends, you'll have to use the external vendor specific tools. You'll have to download the tool and run Julia under that tool. You can do the same with, with CUDA, of course, and, and the tools there are called Ansight Systems and Ansight Compute. And they can still be very useful because, for example, Ansight Compute offers a graphical overview, what was shown textually in my previous slide. Ansight Compute can be used to zoom into a kernel, and well, all of the other backends have something similar. So in the case of Metal, it's Xcode for the application profile, uh, instruments for the application profiler and Xcode for kernel profiling. AMD GPU.gl uh, has RockProf, uh, OneAPI.gl has VTune. And we generally always try to integrate as much as possible with these backends. Uh, for example, um, sending the name of compiled kernels to the profiling tool or making it possible to interactively profile uh, so as a result, for example, with CUDA.gl, you can actually launch Julia under Ansight and then still use a revise to incrementally work on your application and generate new profiler traces without ever having to quit Julia. So that's pretty neat. And all of that is generally documented in each of our GPU packages, documentation websites. So at this point, I've been showing quite a lot. So let's maybe make it a little more uh, 
concrete by showing how you would actually use this to implement some application. And my dummy application here is to uh, compute the root mean square error of two matrix inputs A and B. Um, and writing this with, with array operations is really nice and, and readable. So we named the square root of the sum of uh, the difference of A and B power two divided by the length of uh, either array, assuming that their length is equal. Uh, if we implement this like this in Julia and we execute this on uh, 2048 by 2048 float 32 single precision inputs on my CPU, we get a performance that is, yeah, fairly slow, three and a half milliseconds. If we just simply port this to the GPU by uploading this memory to the GPU by calling the array constructor, and we again benchmark this, we get 57 microseconds, which is, of course, an, an, an enormous speed up. It must be said here that I'm not including the memory transfer, which is uh, an unfair thing to do when benchmarking. On the other hand, for many realistic applications, you generally will not be copying memory back and forth again. So it is nonetheless an interesting comparison to just look at the raw performance of the operation. There's two other things to note here. First is the call to CUDA.allowScaler false. This is to avoid what I mentioned before, where a abstract array fallback might trigger scalar iteration, which is when you have a for loop that computes something element by element by copying element by element from the GPU and back. That's extremely expensive. And in order to avoid that, you can call this function allow scalar with a false argument, which will disallow scalar iteration. And this will allow you to very quickly spot performance issue when porting from the CPU to the GPU. We don't disable this all the time because Sometimes it may not hurt performance. For example, you might be fetching a single element back at the end of your algorithm. Uh, it's also possible that you trigger this when, uh, for example, displaying stuff in the REPL and you generally want, don't want that to fail all the time. And it may also be very convenient when initially porting code from the CPU to the GPU so that you can still verify the results without having to port everything in one go. Another final thing to note here is that despite me mentioning that you have to use CUDA.addSync CUDA with uh, benchmark tools, here I'm not doing so. And this is because the root mean square error implementation of us here, it actually fetches the scalar result by calling the sum function. So the CPU has to wait nonetheless uh, for the GPU to finish. In any case, it, it's always safe if you're not sure whether an operation is asynchronous or not to add the CUDA.addSync in front because there's almost no performance overhead whatsoever. So next, we want to optimize. Question, go ahead. Yeah, one question. Um, because you mentioned this allow scalar and and I I have no not so much intuition to admit kind of what kind of for loop is valid and what not. You, you mentioned it one time already. I just imagine like a sum could also be implemented as a as a for loop somehow internally. And I guess something like this would still work, um, but there are other kinds of for loops which do not work or um, yeah. How, how is yeah, this? well, so I think the best example is for example, the, uh, the subtraction here, A minus B. This could be implemented by just doing each index A of B in a for loop and then taking an element and subtracting that element and then writing it to an output. If you write code like that, this will actually execute on the CPU. So we don't have a magical compiler that looks at the code you've written and compiles or optimizes that for the GPU. We only compile kernel code for the GPU. So if you write a for loop that accesses element by element of an array input, this will just execute on the CPU. So in that sense, there is no for loop code that you can write that will automatically execute on the GPU. What I mentioned that is safe for loop is, is when, you, for example, you have a iterative algorithm where you have to perform many iterations. And within the body of the for loop, you still perform array operations that will launch kernels on the GPU. That is, of course, a fine thing to do. It's only when you perform element-wise operations using for loop that you generally want to be using an alternative that uses a kernel instead of performing that operation on the CPU. 
Okay, got it. And the sum, this is also implemented as the kernel then, if I understand yes, it correctly. The sum function is implemented in CUDA.gl using a parallel reduction. Okay, yeah, thank you. This helped a lot. Sure. So next thing is to optimize the implementation. And even though it's only a single line, there's generally a couple of things you do when you've written an application using array operations. And those apply to all kinds of array uh, applications, not only on the GPU. For example, you'll want to pre-allocate outputs. Uh, you'll want to prefer in-place operations instead of out-of-place operations that, again, allocates in the middle of your application. And you also generally want to fuse operations together as much as possible. And to zoom in on that fusion, there's actually something we can fuse here. For example, if, you, if we see the A minus B and then the power two, if we instead make this subtraction a dot operation as well, this will be fused inside a single broadcast operation. Whereas before we would first launch a kernel for the subtraction and then a kernel for the broadcast operation. So we're saving uh, both an allocation here, a kernel launch, and the compiler will make it possible to uh, optimize globally, specifically avoiding those additional writes and reads from global memory, which are very expensive on the GPU. And as you can see here on the CPU, we've got the time in, in half, and on the GPU as well, time savings are considerable just by fusing a couple of operations together. I mean, you can actually fuse more by, for example, keeping the entire broadcast lazy, meaning, meaning not eagerly materializing it, and then passing that broadcast object to the sum function. By doing so, we're fusing the reduction together with all of the element-wise operations. Sadly, on the CPU, that regressed performance. I'm not sure why, I didn't have the time to look into it. But on the GPU, we save some more time. So yeah, that's great. And at this point, you, sh you generally should be happy. Uh, we've implemented uh, a quote-unquote GPU application that performs considerably faster than our CPU implementation. Um, and what's 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 interesting here is that that implementation is still generic, so it executes both on the CPU and on the GPU. And this kind of of general generic code is is, is really interesting, and it's it's an important feature of writing array code in Julia, where it's it's possible to write generic code that can get reused in a variety of situations. So if you, if if the array code you write is generic. People might run it on the GPU. People might uh, differentiate it. People might uh, run it in a distributed setting. And that's all because of keeping your code as generic as possible. And there's a couple of, of recommendations here to do so. So one is to avoid what I mentioned, the uh, abstract array fallback that uses loops, but always prefer to use array operations, which can then be specialized or implemented by, for example, the GPU backend you're using. Um, if you have to allocate outputs, always use the similar function. Don't just use the array constructor. Uh, if you need to dispatch, again, don't dispatch on the array type itself, but dispatch on the abstract array super type. Uh, if you define structures, uh, try to avoid array typed fields. But if you make your fields parametric, then it's possible to instantiate a version of that struct with GPU arrays inside of them, whereas otherwise, if you're hard coding it with CPU arrays, that's not possible, and so on and so forth. And th that's a bit of a, a design consideration when writing array-based applications to keep them as generic as possible to open up reuse by other people and in other situations. And for a slightly con contrived but nonetheless interesting demonstration of that, um, with, with these two lines of expressions, I'm composing a whole lot of, of packages that weren't necessarily meant to be combined. So on one hand, we have our f function, which is user code. We're mapping that using the map implementation from GPU arrays. Uh, we're using CUDA.gl for the inner Q array array type, meaning that this memory will be stored on the GPU. But then by using the dual type from forward diff, we can make it so that we compute the derivative information, 
And using the distributed functions, we make it up, it all operates on multiple GPUs instead of a single GPU. So again, this is combining huge amounts of code that wasn't necessarily written to be composed together, but nonetheless, because all of these packages have been written generically, it's still possible. And this is one of the beauties of, of writing uh, array codes in Julia, and it all is made possible by having a JIT compiler and the ability to compose all this code together and generate optimized code uh, whenever needed. So for the final bit of this demonstration, let's do the complete opposite. And instead of writing something nice and portable, let's write a kernel function. Um, so again, I'm going back to my root mean square error function. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see my host function. So that's the code that's going to be executing from the CPU. We have our A and B QRA inputs. We assert that the sizes are similar, uh, different, identical, sorry. We allocate an initialize output memory, and then we launch our kernel function. And the kernel function is shown on the right. And this is a very naive implementation where um, we compute a single subtraction, we square it by two, and then we atomically update a single cell of atomic memory on our device. And then on the CPU side, when the kernel finishes, we fetch the contents of that memory, we divide it by the length, and we take the square root. So this would be the initial naive implementation of this root mean square error function. And as you can see, performance is horrendous. We're actually slower than the initial CPU implementation. And the reason basically is that writing GPU kernels is tricky, it's hard. Uh, what the, the major issue here is, is that for every element in A and B, we're performing an atomic update in global memory. And because of that, we're essentially serializing the execution on the GPU. There's no parallelism because every atomic operation has to happen um, sequentially. We can avoid that by, for example, adding a loop in our kernel so that we don't have to perform an atomic operation for every element, but that we just have to perform one atomic operation for every thread. So that significantly reduces global memory traffic, as well as the serialization effect I mentioned before, and performance greatly improves, a uh, factor 50 improvement. But still, we're slower than our array implementation, and that's because we're still actually doing much too many atomic operations. Um, and in order to avoid all of these atomic operations, we were going to use the shared memory I mentioned before, which is that local scratch pad memory that we can use to communicate between threads that run on the same uh, streaming multiprocessor. And using that shared memory, we can, we can do something called a, a, a tree reduction, where an, instead of uh, every thread writing to global memory, we're first going to send our partially reduced data to a single thread in our block. The block is the abstraction for code running on the same multiprocessor. And as a result, only one thread in a block is going to have to do an atomic operation to global memory. And here we can see that this, this greatly improves performance. We are now faster than the initial array implementation or even the fused array implementation. And it shows that it can be very valuable to write your own kernel function and the ability to do so in the same programming language where you wrote your array application is very valuable because you can start off with an array operation, port it to the GPU by changing the array type, running out on the profiling and observing what's slow. And then maybe if you're experienced enough writing a optimized kernel implementation all within the same language without having to know any lower level languages to do so. However, at this point, we've written a kernel that's specific to CUDA.gl, which is not nice. So you might be interested to try and implement kernels that are actually portable across GPU vendors, much like the array ab abstractions are. And for that, we have kernel abstractions.gl, which is a package that essentially um, provides abstractions for all of the functionality that I mentioned, being the indexing intrinsics, the shared memory, the atomics, and 
some of the subgroup intrinsics. So here on the right hand side, you can see that that implementation where it's it's basically just a one on one translation, with the exception that we do not support currently kernel abstraction.gl does not clearly support having a for loop within a kernel uh, to implement this so called grid stride loop. So we're back to performing one atomic operation for every um, for more threads than we otherwise would. And this slightly regressive performance uh, to 90 microseconds. But that's not a necessity. It's, it's, it's possible to use kernel abstractions to the right performance sensitive code that performs well across GPU backends. And we've actually recently demonstrated that uh, using DiffyQ GPU, uh, which is a package that implements many of the differential equations, solvers, and operations using kernel abstractions.gl in order for it to execute seamlessly across all of the GPU backends that we support. And I think I'm going to end with that. It's been 50 minutes, so this has been quite a bit of an introduction. So just to summarize, scientific computing is a good match for GPU programming because we have lots of data parallelism, we have lots of complexity, and that's great for GPUs. And Julia is actually well positioned to target GPUs. We have uh, a JIT we can use to create powerful array abstractions, uh, and we have all of the flexibility and the nice language features to make it as user-friendly as possible. And the key there is to always start with arrays, which are again user friendly, easy to get started with. You don't need to use and you don't need to have any GPU programming experience. However, we give you all of the benchmarking profiler and kernel implementation tools to once you've found a performance hotspot in your array applications to write your own kernel functions for that. And you can even do so in a way that's portable across all of the GPU vendors. So at this point, I would recommend trying this out. All of this, all of these packages I mentioned here are fairly mature. They've been uh, in development and in use for many years. Um, there's a website, juliagpu.org, where we have a blog. Once in a while, we post something about, uh, say, new releases of these packages or some nice demonstrations and so on. And we also have a bi-weekly office hours, which is on the Julia community calendar where you can ask for questions or if you have any issues, feel free to visit. There's also a Slack channel and discourse channel. So lots of lots of material, lots of way to get started and uh, let us know how it works. And if there's any more questions, I'll be, uh, I'll be hanging around for a bit still. Thank you very much, Tim. That's really a great introduction. I myself who haven't, hasn't worked so much on GPUs, I, I feel very confident now and have a good overview and I hope there is also kind of a lot deep dive possible. And hence, I'm hoping for a couple of more questions from the audience. So please feel welcome to yeah ask whatever you ever want to ask um, about GPU implementation in Julia. To, ah, there's one question from Benedict. Hi, hello. Uh, thanks for the great talk and thanks for the great work. Um, we are developing a, a Julia package, uh, a machine learning package in Julia, and that wouldn't be possible without without your work. Um, so my question would be regard. So uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, my my question would be regarding that package. So we we is open source. Everything is on GitHub, and we would like to integrate um, GPU tests into our CI but I'm not sure what the best tool is for that. I think I saw CUDA.jl is doing it with this build kite implementation, uh, with this build kite software, but I don't know if there is any uh, if there's any alternative to that. There is, but the bottom line is that you generally have to self-host your own workers with a GPU because none of the free and available CI services like uh, GitHub Actions and so on, offer GPU workers. Again, GPU workers are much too expensive and they're, they're often getting abused by crypto miners. So you'll probably have to deploy your own workers with, okay. with, with GitHub Actions. That's fairly fairly simple to do. You just need a system with a GPU in there. Now, then... for the Julia community, we actually do offer some GPU CI services for Julia packages. So if you have an open source package, you can actually get in touch with us to 
to get access to our Julia GPU build guide instance and be able to use the GPUs that we have to offer. But that uh, does require a use of build guide, which is it's fairly simple. If you if you, if you have a look at the uh, CUDA.jl repository, it's a single pipeline that YAML um, that needs to be yeah that's being read by the uh, build guide and job generator and then executed on a worker with a GPU. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks. <laughs> and we'll, then we'll use that. Great. I would have a question about um, you, the last part. You mentioned kernel abstractions, and that this is, a, yeah, one way to write generic code. On the Julia Con in in summer, I got to know about parallel stencils as also a way to write generic code, which somehow works on on all backends. Okay. Do you have experience with this? Can you compare the approaches? Is this just kind of a third way, array, kernel? Um, yeah. Something in in a way, it's a third way, but it's a domain-specific abstraction for the problems that, well, for stencil operations. Whereas kernel abstractions gives you all of the flexibility that the hardware has to offer, so it's not limited to stencil operations. What I've been showing here is generally writing kernel functions that are element-wise transformations. But as I mentioned with reduction, the, the reduction example in the end was not an element-wise reduction. It had to do more complicated parallel reductions where in the end you, you, you don't have a one-on-one -on -one mapping from threads to um, elements. So in that sense, kernel abstractions gives you all of the flexibility that the device has to offer. Whereas again, parallel stencils is more of a domain-specific abstractions that start from well the domain experience the domain information that there's writing stencils on um on gpus and on multi-node gpus so it depends on what you want to do if you want to write stencils then probably parallel stencils is going to be more interesting if you need to if you need additional flexibility then you'll have to you'll require the ability to write full-fledged kernels and for that you either do so using one of the backends specifically or using kernel abstractions thank you a lot yeah makes sense i see there's another question yeah uh hello uh, thank you, Tim, for the nice talk. So I come from uh, GPU programming background, but not from Julia background. Uh, but I was wondering, so uh, one API, at least uh, in its uh, C++ version, uh, offers also support for uh, CUDA and uh, AMD GPUs. And with AMD GPUs, have you explored it uh, in uh, this way as a uh, yeah as a portability layer for your i forgot the term as kernel abstraction layer or are you using your own layer on top of uh, CUDA heap uh, one api metal everything yeah very good question um the 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 problem with one api is that it's um vendor neutral abstraction sits at the data parallel c plus plus level so it's in a way not actually one API or at least not the one API level zero uh, interface that we use that is portable across vendors. So the level zero API that we use is only implemented for Intel GPUs. There is no implementation for CUDA or for AMD. If we were to target SICL or something similar to, uh, at, at a higher level, then it would be possible to interface with other vendors. However, Recently, Intel has changed or introduced an additional vendor neutral level, which is called the Unified Runtime. And the Unified Runtime offers the, the flexibility that we require, which is the, the reason we use level zero and we don't interface at the sickle level. So it gives us the necessary flexibility, but still implemented for multiple vendors using adapter functionality. We do not support that yet. In Julia, we're waiting for this to hit a more stable, um, a stable release version. But at that point, we will be looking into generalizing the current one API implementation to this unified runtime 
The reason we haven't done it yet is because we have our own solution to this problem, namely kernel abstractions at the kernel level and just plain array operations at the higher level. So there, it, it, it didn't seem relevant to try and introduce an additional vendor neutral um, way of working with one of these backends. In the future, again, we, we might explore this when the unified runtime uh, matures a little. Thank you. I would have another performance question. So if I think about CPU code, then um, I'm always asked to kind of prevent or, or improve the type inference so that I don't have too many dynamic um, branches. Is something of this also important to, for writing GPU code? Yes, this is one of the areas I, I haven't touched out of time constraints. Um, so one of the, the reason we require or advise this for CPU code is such that the generated code is high quality. On the GPU, this is a requirement. So if you write type unstable code or code that allocates, we will actually refuse to compile your code to a uh, GPU kernel. We require the code that you write to be statically compilable. On the CPU, that's an optimization. On the GPU, that's a necessity because of how the, the compiler has currently been constructed. OK, yeah. That used to be very problematic. It's still annoying. Um, but at least the, the compiler feedback has been significantly improved recently. So you actually get a, a compile time stack trace pointing you to, for example, um, the function that you should not call or cannot call or the allocation that, that has been introduced. It's one of the disadvantages of using a dynamic language, which expects that it can do lots of things at runtime when, for example, there's a typo in your code and use that to target a more static environment, namely GPUs. So there's a lot, there's a bit of tension there, but I think that at this point we've, we've reasonably uh, adapted that at least. And this is a theoretic boundary or more practical boundary? You seem to be optimistic that it could at some time be actually even compatible. It could, but it's very tricky. Um, and the, the other reason that we haven't invested too much time in that is again that the, 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 the threads of execution you have on a GPU are always still very lightweight. So if you'd introduce more heavyweight patterns, like for example, doing a syscall to the kernel, if you would introduce that in GPU code and we make it somehow compatible, then you would likely just still end up with very slow code. So that's why we're, we're at this point, we, we don't invest too much time in trying to widen the, the, the ability of things you can do in kernel code. Another one is allocating. We currently disallow allocations in kernel code. We could make it possible using some signal mechanism back to the CPU to allocate and send back to, this, to the GPU to make that possible but it would be extremely slow. So it, 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 and in that sense, we're, we're again assuming that people who write kernels are somewhat knowledgeable, both about how to write high quality Julia code, as well as how to implement code for GPU in a way that we, we, we think it's reasonable to expect them to write this kind of code. Okay, yeah, so thank you, I understood. And if I just combine kernels together, I'm. I'm on the user perspective, then it's really just kind of the same thinking as having G, uh, CPU code. Or... Yes. So the, the 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 array operations you do on the CPU side can still be optimized with the same uh, guidelines that we have for CPU code. And this is generally also one of the advantages of using the array interface because it's it's tricky. It's not impossible, but it's trickier to trigger these compilation failures because you're not writing kernel code generally, you're composing array operations together. Mm -hmm. It's still possible that if, for example, the function that you're broadcasting does something very GPU incompatible, that you would still end up with a compilation failure, but it's less likely. Yeah, thank you a lot. Complex. I also share uh, an, an interesting reason because uh, the previous uh, person who asked the question know about 
GPU programming, but not about GPU programming in Julia. For them, it might be interesting to, for example, look at the resource I've posted just now, which is an example of a much more advanced uh, programming course showing how to do more advanced kernel implementation and API operations in uh, Julia using CUDA on GL. It's not suited for an introduction, but it might be interesting uh, for somebody with that background. I think we have time for still some more questions. So if there is a question in the audience, please yeah, just raise your voice or write it in the chat. What I'm still very curious about is this user friendliness part, especially compared to Python, because Python is apparently still kind of the major driver in yeah, data science and computing. Um, so is CUDA JL uh, a good reason to convince someone using Python to, to switch to Julia? Or is there are there kind of some other points? Which are it depends on their need, but if they need the flexibility, then by all means, CUDA JL or Julia in general is an argument to do so because you just don't have the same flexibility in Python. If all you need to do is to write uh, machine learning operations that have been very well optimized by NVIDIA engineers, then it's probably fine by using PyTorch or by using a NVIDIA optimized version of, um, of NumPy. However, again, as soon as you need to escape that fairly confined subset of array operations that have been implemented in the pre-compiled libraries that NVIDIA has to offer, uh, the array operations that Julia have are vastly more powerful. And when you get to implementing kernels, then there's, there's almost no comparison. I mean, Python does have some, some uh, reasonably powerful ways to implement in kernels like uh, Numba, but it, it doesn't generally offer you the same combination of full language uh, access that is, for example, the ability to define your own your own types and so on, um, with the ability to use all of that the GPU has to offer, like for example the tensor cores or dynamic uh, uh, dynamic kernel launches. So it depends on on what you need as a user. Uh, for some things, Python is is, is user friendlier, but as soon as you need some more flexibility, uh, CUDA.gl is is a is a very powerful contender. Mm -hmm. There's another question from Andre, please. Uh, yes. Uh, so first, a uh, quick note about Python. I guess uh, it probably it's not that obvious for CUDA, but there is no currently supported uh, uh, backend for AMD or Intel GPUs in Numba. So yeah, for CUDA, one might discuss whether Python is better, and uh, but if you want to write Journals, even if level of abstraction of Python is okay for you, I don't think there is any way to go to non-NVIDIA hardware uh, there. But yeah, back to my question. Uh, uh, have you ex explored, tried using uh, Julia GPU with uh, MPI? GPU aware MPI that is copied GPUs. Yes, um, this is actually a very well explored uh, path. Not by me. I'm not an HPC mm -hmm. developer, but mm -hmm. the HPC folks have uh, a, a, a very well developed interface to MPI, where you can very conveniently switch MPI implementations, including switching to the uh, CUDA aware MPI, which fully integrates with CUDA.gl and the cool rate type. So that should work seamlessly. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, the question in chat is, if a GPU supports a new feature like block reduction, how quickly does the GPU, GPU compiler support that? Um, generally, fairly quickly, because again, we we offer all of the flexibility. And one of the very flexible parts is that uh, it's, for example, possible to write inline PTX code, which is the assembly that I showed being generated by LLVM or by the Julia compiler, uh, more broadly speaking. 
Uh, we, we do that for a couple of abstractions where our LLVM version is slightly outdated or where um, LLVM just doesn't support it yet, where we then used inline assembly to target these specific hardware features. So in that sense, it's very easy for us to uh, use whatever, um, whatever the GPU has to offer. And this also ties in with our ability to distribute our own version of the CUDA compiler. Uh, well, the CUDA toolkit as a whole, but that includes the compiler. Um, so we, we are not locked to whatever uh, CUDA version you have installed locally. We can just redistribute the latest compiler, giving you the latest features that you require. And then the question of Reiner, um, how hard is it currently to write truly hardware independent code in order to avoid vendor lock-in? Both with array abstractions and uh, kernels, using kernel abstractions, that's entirely possible. Uh, entire applications have been implementing using these vendor neutral subsets. Um, SciML is one example that uses both. It uses very uh, extensively array operations and all of Julia's high level array operations like broadcast and so on. And when additional flexibility is needed, for example, to implement some of the uh, differential equation solvers, it uses uh, kernel abstractions to write vendor neutral kernel code. So that is very much possible. Another uh, very big project that actually kernel abstractions was created for is uh, the Clima project, uh, where they have a ocean simulating model that's also entirely implemented using kernel abstractions, executes on multiple vendors, GPUs, and integrates with MPI to do so on supercomputers. So that definitely is a possible a possibility. And what's what's also important to note here is that because of Julia's multiple dispatch, you can always write your generic vendor neutral code and provide a couple of very specific optimizations or functions that you then optimize, for example, using um, using vendor specific libraries to perform something in an accelerated manner. So there's no need to choose between the vendor neutral and the vendor specific and optimized one. You can you can mix and match depending on performance and depending on the, your needs of the application. And that's one of the nice uh, aspects of the design of Julia's array abstractions. And another question from me, Stefan speaking. You mentioned the distributed um, at one slide to, to work on multiple GPUs. That's something I also see kind of, yeah, as <laughs> was something which people want. <laughs> And how easily is this possible? Like, are there some extra difficulties when working with multiple GPUs, or is it just working kind of out of the box? The example I gave using distributed arrays.gl was something we were working on a couple of years back, but my intent mainly there was to show the ability to compose code because distributed arrays.gl since then has not been um, significantly developed. Nowadays, you either have to do this using dagger.gl, which is under active development, but the main recommendation is just to use MPI. The CUDA aware MPI is, is well optimized. The across node communication is going to use the optimal fabric to perform computations, uh, to perform communications. Of course, this is an HPC view more, for local node multi-GPU computing, um, we don't have a clear-cut answer, and probably the easiest way is to use NVIDIA's multi-GPU libraries, if you have an NVIDIA GPU, that is. Uh, for example, Kublas nowadays have a multi-GPU version of Kublas. Uh, QF50 also has a multi-GPU version of QF50. Um, we don't have this, this fully automatic approach to multi-GPU computing. And that's also in part not our goal. Again, the abstraction level that we offer is, is pretty much aligned with the abstraction level of, of, of CUDA itself, making it user-friendlier where possible, but not radically changing things, uh, making it a more familiar environment to get started with, but also an environment where you can more easily get to the performance that you require. But as a result, there is also no automatic high-level compiler that's going to manage uh, distributed computing for you. So they have to look into one of the other solutions there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thank you. And also, yeah, thank you for making the link again that the MPI was actually one of the answers. Yeah. So MPI is distributed GPUs already. Yeah. Yeah, of Dagger. I, th I think Dagger is definitely also something to watch, but it will require some more involve involvement for your end, probably to get working or to get working efficiently for your application. Mm -hmm. People seem to be dropping off, so maybe this is a, a good time to end the uh, question session. Yeah. Looks if there's any more questions, feel free to visit the office hours or to, to visit the Slack channel. Uh, we're always there to answer people how uh, beginner questions it might be. Don't hesitate to, uh, to ask any issues. Then let me thank you again, Tim, for being our guest today. It was a pleasure. Um, I think also all the audience learned a lot. And also, of course, big thank you to the audience for being there and yeah, interacting, asking questions, be, yeah, just getting all this information into your head. Thank you all. You're welcome. Have a good night.